We want one. Thanks, guys. Morning, everybody. Breaking news from overnight. Rising tensions with Tehran. Iran denies the U.S. knocked one of its drones from the sky. Only hours after President Trump said the Navy destroyed one that threatened a U.S. warship with 2,000 Marines on board. That's where we are at the moment on a Friday. Welcome, everybody. I'm Bill Hemmer, live here in New York City. Sandra's yeah. got some time off, and welcome back. Yeah, I'm for Heather Childers in today. for Sandra, of course. Nice yeah, breaking that. news on a Friday, yes. of course. Uh, the latest flare up coming just hours or just weeks after Iran uh, shot down an American drone in the Strait of Hormuz. Here's the president yesterday. The boxer took defensive action against an Iranian drone which had closed into a very, very near distance, approximately 1,000 yards, ignoring multiple calls to stand down and was threatening the safety of the ship and the ship's crew. The drone was immediately destroyed. So let's hunt down for the latest today. Trey Yinks begins our coverage live on our Middle East Bureau with the latest on where we think we are. Trey, hello. Hey there, Bill. A major development yesterday when President Trump announced from the White House that a U.S. warship took down an Iranian drone. Here is what we know so far about the incident. Yesterday, the USS Boxer, a Navy amphibious assault ship, entered the Persian Gulf and reportedly engaged the drone around 10 a.m. local time. The 2000 Marine crew had been training previously in the Arabian Sea. A U.S. official did tell Fox News an electronic jamming device was used to carry out the operation. Now, it's unclear whether the Iranian drone was an intelligence gathering or assault aerial system. In a statement, the Pentagon said the drone was within threatening range, causing the U.S. Navy to take defensive action. The USS Boxer was traveling in international waters at the time of the event. The incident comes as Iran said yesterday that it seized a foreign oil tanker suspected of smuggling Iranian fuel to foreign ships. As for Iranian reaction, the head of Iran's Revolutionary Guard said yesterday if any mistakes were made in the region, his forces would take offensive action. The commander did not mention the downing of any drone in his remarks. And today the Iranians are denying any knowledge of the encounter at all with the USS Boxer. The issue of the drone is still under investigation. Based on the latest information I have received from Tehran, we have so far absolutely no information about losing a drone. The denial from Iran's foreign minister, Mohammad Zarif, does take some pressure off the Iranians to respond directly to this incident amid already heightened tensions in the Middle East. Bill? Trey, thank you for that. An update when we get it. Thank you. From Jerusalem. So President Trump now saying that he disagrees with the send her back chant from that rally Wednesday night after his criticism of Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, who was born in Somalia. I was not happy when I heard that chant. What I would suggest, uh, you go there, I go to North Carolina, and you ask the people why did they say that. But that's what they said. That's what they did. They try to do it again. Well, I didn't like that they did it, and I started speaking very quickly. Kevin Cork is live for us from the White House. Uh, Kevin, what is the president saying about the chants and his uh, repudiation of them uh, and the squad's reaction? Well, let's see. In a word, plenty. Uh, let me take you to Twitter. This all from the last hour, and no surprise, the president is pushing back very forcefully on this. He said it is amazing how the fake news media became crazed over the chant, send her back by a packed arena, a record crowd in the great state of North Carolina, but is totally calm and accepting of the most vile and disgusting statements made by the three radical left congresswomen. He went on to say this about the media. They even covered a tiny staged crowd as they greeted foul-mouthed Omar in Minnesota, a state which I will win in 2020 because they can't stand her and her hatred of our country. That escalated quickly. Yesterday, the president explained it was hard to make out what was actually being said at first during that big chant. And there was a pause of about 10 seconds before he went on, but he said once he heard it, he did try to move on. I'm not happy about when I hear a chant like that. And... I've said that, and I've said it very strongly, but I will tell you, uh, the congressmen and women also have a big obligation in this country, and in every country, frankly, but they have a big obligation. And the obligation is to, uh, to love your country. There's such hatred. They have such hatred. I've seen statements that they made with such hatred toward our country. And I don't think that's a good thing. So that was the president yesterday, and it was a very interesting moment over in Minnesota when the congresswoman did, in fact, return to the land of 10,000 lakes. She said the president's words are meaningless. 
I want to make sure that every single person who is in this country, who's aspiring um, to become part of the American fabric, uh, understands that nothing this president says should be taken to heart. We are Americans as much as everyone else. This is our country, and we are where we belong. Are where we belong, the words of Congresswoman Ilhan Omar yesterday. Heather? So we have a new uh, labor secretary with a familiar last name. Let's switch gears, yeah. talk about this. And what can you tell you, what can you tell us about that? Well, uh, we actually, you may remember this yesterday, we suspected we'd get a bit of breaking news uh, late in the day. It happened a little later than we anticipated. And as you said, it's a, a name that is actually fairly familiar to folks, certainly here in Washington, D.C., the last name of Scalia. First name is Eugene. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because, yes, in fact, he is the son of the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. He has been nominated to be the new Labor Secretary. He is a well-regarded attorney and, as I mentioned, son of the late Justice Antonin Scalia. If confirmed, by the way, he would replace the outgoing Alex Acosta, whose last day on the job, we believe, is today. Of course, he was felled by his office's prosecutorial decisions in the Epstein case over in Florida when he was a U.S. attorney more than a decade ago. Uh, the president and first lady are expected to take part in an Apollo 11 uh, photo shoot later today. Uh, maybe we'll get some pics if we do. I promise to pass them along. But for now, back to you. All right. Kevin Cork, live from the White House for us. Thank you. So let's get back to the war words between the president and the so-called squad. That is Matt Schlaff, former White House political director, American conservative union chairman. Matt, how you doing? Good morning to you. Uh, does, Good to be with does, you, Bill. Does this linger or is this behind us for now? No, no. This is the 2020 election this whole question about what is america why was america founded what is america's purpose in the world and a new radicalized younger cadre of democrats including some in congress who call themselves the squad but activists all over the country in all 50 states who believe that america is a bad country that treats people of color poorly that treats women poorly that uh, is too free market and capitalistic, needs to be more socialistic. We need to be more like Sweden or France. They want America to be America in name only. Underneath the name would be just another European socialist country. So this you, is the battle for the future then, of the country. Yeah, you agree with those who say the freshman women are taking control of the party. Um, is no, that a I don't step think too this, far? I don't think, here's what I'd say, Bill, is mm -hmm. it's one little step there. I think the squad has a very, very important and bold voice within this new Democratic Socialist Party. But they are simply just four representatives of a whole slew of thousands of Democrats across this country who want to change the face of America. They will determine which one of those presidential candidates is the Democratic nominee. The Democratic Party has fundamentally changed. This is not John Fitzgerald Kennedy's party. This is not Franklin Delano Roosevelt's party. It is, they want it to be a whole new party and they want to change America and what it so is in its is core what, beliefs. So here's what Congresswoman Omar said on Capitol Hill before heading home. I believe he's a fascist. Um, we're going to continue being a nightmare to this president because his policies are a nightmare to us. Here's what the Wall Street Journal writes today. Here's the headline. Trump has regrets. The send her back chant at his rally was an ugly political moment. Matt. Yeah, look, I, I think if you don't really understand what America is all about and you don't love her foundational beliefs, you ought to go home. If you don't love it here, leave it. Now, the president has power when it comes to immigration, and so there's a little bit of asymmetrical debate going on, so I can understand why this is jarring to people. And let's face it, the president did the right thing yesterday in saying that it would be a, it's a step too far to urge the presidency to somehow send somebody out of the country who's here lawfully. My Lord, he can't even send people home who are here illegally, so it is a little bit of an absurd charge. He did the right thing. But when it comes right down to it, their beef is not with the president. Their beef is with the American people. Those people who filled that arena in North Carolina, they love this country, Bill. They're patriotic. They don't want them to destroy uh, what America means. This is, like I said, this is a real battle. We will not ever get beyond this. This, this whole confrontation between the squad and the president is nothing 
but a, uh, a, an example of what we have to do politically to save okay. the country from these radical voices. Quickly, I just want to get this in. Marco Rubio's video here on selective outrage. Just watch this. The hypocrisy, the self-righteousness outrages people too. And on top of it, you have these four members who are Americans, but they're also political bullies. They go around attacking people, but when you hit them back, it's because they're women of color. It's absurd. People are tired of this game. You have to immediately respond, pick a side between these two. It's a game I'm not going to play. He's talking about a country. He's talking about a town of outrage there. Matt, last comment on that. Got to roll. Yeah, just real quickly, my, uh, my wife, Mercedes, uh, her mm -hmm. parents came here from Cuba. Her uncle is staying with us. These people, when they call the president a fascist, it makes immigrants who came from fascist regimes, it makes them outraged. Donald Trump is standing up for individual freedoms. These people who support Trump oppose fascism. Socialism is just another form of fascism. If we can't win this battle, America will never no, be you, the same. But you're okay with him, with the comments from yesterday, taking that back, right? Yeah, it was the right thing. But look, I will just use different words. If you don't love it here, if you don't love the yeah, fo foundational the principles of America, get the hell out. Yeah, well, well th there's the campaign. Matt, thank you for your time today Thanks, from Washington, D.C. Fired up about it. Thank you, Matt. More to come on this 11 Pass. Back to heaven. Well, Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden duking it out over health care. Now the back and forth over policy is getting personal. So who will come out on top? Also, the U.S. Senate planning a vote on the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund after a dispute erupted on the floor. Will that bill pass? We'll get to the back and forth on that in a moment. And then there's this fiery hearing on Capitol Hill. Uh, Democrats hammering the acting Homeland Security chief over the migrant crisis. Reaction from National Border Patrol Council VP Art Del Cueto up next. The border flows and the custody situation remain beyond crisis levels. We are still seeing 2,500 crossings a day, mostly families. Fundamentally, however, a durable solution to this crisis lies with Congress. Warnings all across the country, 180 million people could feel sweltering temperatures this weekend. Uh, forecasters predict that the heat could break records, approaching triple digits in parts of the East Coast and the Midwest. Major cities opening up some cooling centers, urging people, listen to it, to restrict your outdoor activities, Bill. Will do. <laughs> Noted. Air conditioning. Don't go outside. Right. You're doing a great job, right? Is it what you're saying? We're doing our level best in a very What does that mean? What does that mean when a child is sitting in their own feces? Come on, man. What's that about? None of us would have our children in that position. So then this was heated. Congressman Elijah Cummings tearing into Ackling Homeland Security Secretary Kevin McAleenan. Art Del is the Vice President of the National Border Patrol Council. Sir, how are you doing? Good morning to you. I, I know you're keeping a very close ear on this thing from yesterday. Did we hear any solutions in that hearing? <laughs> I don't think we did, but I, I can tell you, uh, hearing the congressman go off and, 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 and start saying we were seeing kids in feces, I don't think he's been down there because that's just not happening. Uh, you know, that's a completely false narrative. And when you have somebody in that position screaming and yelling at the top of their lungs because everyone's watching, uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, that's what they take out of that. They say, oh, look, he said that these kids are in their feces. That's not true. That's simply not true. We got men and women down there that are taking care of these kids. We're looking after them. We're making sure everything's taken care of. And to sit there in a congressional hearing and, and scream at, you know, at Kevin McAleen and tell him, you know, these kids are sitting there. That's just not true. Okay, it so, just is not um, true. And it, it upsets me when I hear yeah, that. Yeah, I bet it does. Yeah, here's <clears throat> more of that, too. And I'll ask you a specific question on solutions. Watch here. Do you think that the policy of child separation could have contributed to a dehumanizing culture within CBP? We do not have a dehumanizing culture at CBP. Okay. You want to keep kids the longer. It's been standard. very clear from this administration, you want to kids keep kids longer. We want to keep families together through an immigration proceeding. By keeping fair kids and expeditious longer. Back to the question then, sir. Did, did they come up with solutions to try and figure this out, to make it better? No, I think it was just a lot of back and forth. Uh, and, and, you know, when they start asking, do we want to keep kids longer? Uh, I think their argument is obviously the child separation. And, but the problem is we're having a lot of individuals that are renting their children out to people that are not 
uh, the, the guardians, they're not the parents, because they know that there's a loophole within the immigration where after 20 days they get released in the country. And that's some of the problem. So when we get some of these uh, kids that come across the border and we do discover that the people that they cross with are not the parents, obviously we're going to separate those individuals and it's going to take some time till we find some of the parents and in many instances some of the parents don't come and they don't want to pick up their children they're scared that they're going to get deported themselves huh. i will also add that some of these children are 15 16 and 17 years old so they, they pretty much already know the rhetoric and what to say and and that's some of the problem what they need to do is they come they need to come together and figure out a way so they can fast track and see whose claims are real asylum claims and whose are not asylum claims. That's what they need to start doing. Yeah, you follow this with Mexico, right? The new asylum rules is apparently in effect. <clears throat> Mexico doesn't like it. Here's what the ambassador said. We have said once and again that we are not ready to sign it. You cannot leave the people waiting in Mexico for three years. Uh, your reaction to that first? I mean, that's, uh, that alone is, is, is a huge obstacle. That's, the, well, that's one of the biggest obstacles. And then when, when they turn around, I mean, I'm just sick and tired of them constantly attacking. Uh, I know the congressman said something that he's sick of hearing people say, stop attacking Border Patrol. Well, I mean, you're, attack you're attacking them for no reason. You're attacking the men and women that are out there for no reason. And then you have, you know, one congress lady that just, she clings on to some Facebook page that I can tell you right now, a lot of the things that have been said about it are, are completely wrong I don't condone a lot of what was posted on that page none of us can the National Board of Patrol Council were the very first ones that were ahead of the game explaining how there was issues with that page and now they turn around and they want to paint every single Border Patrol agent based on a few comments that they saw on that page and that is just ridiculous now, based, that is based not on, the way the men and women on of the Border heard, Patrol are uh, we heard yesterday more than six years now being investigated <clears throat> we'll see where that goes uh, last point here do you see what the Washington Post put out a few days ago with this poll Six in ten Mexicans say migrants are a burden on their country because they take jobs and benefits that should belong to Mexicans. That's what the poll found out in Mexico. Last comment on that, we've got to run. It's not a racist thing. It has nothing to do with race. Illegal is not a race. I've said it many times before. Art, thank you. Art Del Cueto. Thanks for coming back today, okay? Thank you. You bet. Well, coming up, a daring escape after a fire breaks out at a high-rise apartment building. All of it caught on camera. Also, some tense moments. Popular amusement park. Check it out. That roller coaster stopped mid-ride. Uh, they were stranded for a long time. We'll tell you how they got down. Coming up. A fire, West Philadelphia. Check it out. A TV news chopper. Caught this action last night, climbing down the side of a 19-story apartment building to safety. That fire injured about four residents, three police officers who were treated at the scene. Everyone expected to be okay. That man got down okay, and they believe that fire started in a, in a trash wow. compactor. Looks like Spider-Man. One way to do it, huh? Mm -hmm. 18 years after 9-11 after getting 402 votes in the House, and now with 75 co-sponsors in the U.S. Senate. This vote is so long overdue, and it's welcome news for every 9-11 first responder, every family member of a first responder, who have now been waiting 14 years for Congress to finally get this job done. Well, 2020 candidate uh, Kirsten Gillibrand sounding off there after the Senate agrees to vote on a bill reauthorizing the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund. A fight erupting after a GOP lawmaker called for a cap on the fund's budget. Uh, Doug McElway's live for us on Capitol Hill with more on this. Hi, Doug. Hi, Heather. In the Senate vote to fully fund the 9-11 Victims Fund will happen this coming Tuesday. It is expected to pass, but not before a lot of really heated exchanges between the New York Senate delegation, Senators Gillibrand and Schumer, against a couple of uh, fiscal hawks. Mike Lee of Utah and Rand Paul of Kentucky. Both of those skeptics are familiar, deeply familiar with how in Washington it's nearly impossible to turn off the spigot for money once it's been turned on or appropriated. Senator Lee's amendment would impose oversight of the 9-11 fund to, uh, to guard against fraud and abuse. He said since 2011, the 9-11 Victims Fund has always had finite authorizations and by all accounts it has an excellent record avoiding waste and abuse. These two things are not coincidental. They go together. 
Senator Paul, on the other hand, wanted to impose PAYGO standards where new expenditures are offset by commensurate cuts elsewhere in the budget. Senator Gillibrand and John Stewart, formerly of The Daily Show, tore into the Kentucky senator. Senator Paul's amendment is also needless because it cuts every, every other government program. Every time we have an amendment like this, you're being asked to make a choice. Every member of our U.S. Senate should be standing with our 9-11 heroes and vote against these wrongful acts of obstruction. It's, it's absolutely outrageous, and you'll pardon me if I'm not impressed in any way by Rand Paul's fiscal responsibility virtue signaling. But even Senator Paul acknowledges that his amendment would get only 10 to 15 votes in the Senate and would die. He fired back at Jon Stewart. Listen to this. So he's really not informed and his name calling just sort of exposes him as a, a left winger, part of the left wing mob that really isn't using his brain and is willing to call people names. And it's, it's really kind of disgusting because, see, he pretended for years when he was on his comedy show to be somebody who could see both sides and see through the BS on both sides. Well, now he is the BS. The bill would extend the 9-11 Victims Fund through the year 2092, the House version of the bill, in effect, making it permanent, just as Senator Paul had feared. Again, that vote taking place this coming Tuesday. Heather, back to you. Doug McElway, live for us. Thank you. 27 passed the fight over Medicare for All, turning personal for two of the candidates. Why Bernie Sanders took a swipe at Joe Biden. Uh-oh. And President Trump says that he was not happy about a send-her-back chant at his rally this week. As the target, Congresswoman Omar fires back. We'll dig into that escalating feud with Mike Huckabee up next. I hate the president because he has two strikes against him. He loves America, and he's the greatest president that Israel has ever seen. A Medicare for All system simply expands over a four-year period what is already a good program for seniors. We expand benefits for seniors by including dental care, hearing aids, and vision care. I think people should be able to, if their employer is offering insurance, that they in fact like keep it, not have to get into a Medicare for All proposal. You know, you know, we come to this, a clash of ideas. Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden hitting each other over health care, escalating the battle of two of the top 2020 Democrats. Peter Ducey picks up our coverage live in D.C. Peter, nice to see you. What was the what warning does Joe Biden have about Medicare for all? the only Democrat polling in double digits running to strengthen Obamacare and not borrowing Medicare for all from Bernie Sanders for his platform. Bernie's been the only guy completely honest about saying it's going to raise taxes to the middle class. He's been straightforward about it. Everyone will get off the plan that exists now and get on another plan under Bernie's Medicaid for all plan. It's Medicaid for all. It's a different plan. And so it doesn't mean it's good or bad. Under the proposal I have, you'd be able to keep your insurance with your employer if your employer still is prepared to pay for the insurance. But now Sanders is trying to apply pressure of his own, urging Biden and other Democrats to sign a pledge not to take large donations from pharmaceutical executives and now comparing him to the man they are both trying to beat. Sanders tells the New York Times, I am disappointed, I have to say, in Joe, who is a friend of mine, really distorting what Medicare for All is about. Unfortunately, he is sounding like Donald Trump. He is sounding like the health care industry in that regard. Healthcare and the economy are generally the top two issues for primary voters. Medicare for all would impact both and Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden on complete opposite issues of it. So Bill. what's the chances we see Biden and Sanders going after each other on the, uh, the debate stage on that, Peter? No chance this month because Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden wound up on different stages. CNN did a live draw to figure out how to divvy up the 20 qualifiers, and Sanders wound up on a stage with Elizabeth Warren. So the two most progressive candidates are going to be front and center, while Biden found himself on a stage with Kamala Harris again, the former prosecutor who launched an attack on Biden at the last debate that Biden said he was not prepared for. So now it's his chance to prepare an attack of his own if he wants. Bill. Here we go. Thank you, Peter. Nice to see you. Peter Ducey in Washington, D.C. Thanks. Excuse me. Well, really, uh, if you would have heard, there was a tremendous amount of uh, noise and action and everything else. I started very quickly, and I think you know that. 
Well, I know. You, maybe you're giving me too much credit. You're used to giving me too much credit. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well, President Trump saying that he was not happy with a chant by his supporters at Wednesday, or Wednesday night's rally. The crowd shouting, send her back, directed at Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, the first Somali-American woman to serve in Congress. Well, let's bring in Governor Mike Huckabee, former Arkansas governor and a Fox News contributor. Thank you for joining us. Great to be with you. Thank so, you, Heather. What the president had to say, was it enough? Well, it's about all he can say. I mean, no matter what he says, they're never going to accept it. I think we need to go back a couple of years and remember when these same Democrats who were, you know, tearing their garments because of the things either the president or his supporters have said, uh, were calling on uh, Sebastian Borka, my good friend and a good guy, uh, to be deported. The same people. Jerry Nadler actually said that we need to see his immigration papers and maybe need to send him back because he were accusing him of being a Nazi of all things. This is the insanity of today's politics. What we ought to be talking about, Heather, mm -hmm. is the substance of what people like Congresswoman Omar has said regarding boycott, divestiture, and sanctions on Israel. Well, before I just we, got before, back from there yesterday right, morning. But, I'm going to tell you something. That's crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Put that on the floor and let every member of the House vote on BDS. That'd be great. Let's just see yeah, where they we're stand. We're going to talk about that a little bit more with you in just a moment, but everyone keeps talking about moving on. Will the media allow the Republican Party, will the Democrats allow the Republican Party to do that? Or will they, this become, as Matt Schlapp said earlier in our segment, he was very fired up. He said, this is the 2020 election. Well, Heather, you repeated yourself. You said the media and the Democrats, uh, they've become one and the same for the most part. Uh, no, they're not going to let it go. They can't. They got nothing else. All they've got is to try to attack the president personally because his philosophical underpinning of deregulating, lowering taxes, being strong with America is working. They can't defeat him politically because he won the election. So the only thing they're left to do is attack him personally. That's what they're left with. And so whether it's a, a legal challenge to him or trying to impeach him, look at what the best analysis of this is. Mm -hmm. This is a personal attack on him because they cannot defeat his policies and they can't argue that they have better ones because theirs failed, his are working, and that's where they're stuck, personal um, attacks. I don't think the American people are that stupid and they can mm -hmm. see through it. Let's bring up this tweet. This was from Lindsey Graham. He says, you know, being called uh, racist comes with the territory, basically, of being a Republican. Something I've learned, if you are a Republican nominee for president or president, you will be accused of being a racist. John Lewis compared John McCain's campaign to being like that of George Wallace. It comes with the territory, unfortunately. That's a sad state of affairs. It is a sad state of affairs. It's just a reality. And I, I appreciate Senator Graham for pointing out that John McCain was accused of being a racist, for heaven's mm -hmm. sakes. I mean, I, I don't hear anybody saying that today because he wasn't then uh, and he never was. But neither was Donald Trump. I mean, the fact is, if Donald Trump had been a racist all these years, don't you think it would have come out somewhere in the life that he lived, which was about as public as any elected official has ever lived? And the fact is, a person doesn't just suddenly become a racist at the age of 72, having not been one up until that point. I mean, if people would just exercise enough brain cells to operate a flashlight, they would clearly recognize that th these charges are on their face laughable. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Ilhan Omar, she uh, says that she's not going to let it go. In fact, she says she's going to be a nightmare for the president. Listen to this. He is threatened because we criticize him. But the reality is he is threatened because we are inspiring people to dream about a country That's right. that yep. recognizes their dignity and their yeah. humanity. And when I said I was the president's nightmare, well, you're watching right. it now. Yeah. His nightmare is seeing a Somali immigrant refugee rise to Congress. Well, some say uh, the nightmare <laughs> is how she deals with Israel. Let's go back to what you were talking about and the yeah. boycott. Um, and she likened it to boycotting the Jewish state as well and boycotts of now Nazi Germany. Yeah, the most ridiculous thing she said, and she said a lot of ridiculous things, is somehow equating Israel with Nazi Germany. I mean, and you think of the irony of that. 
Uh, this is a country that was created in modern times uh, in response to the Holocaust, in which six million Jews were savagely and in cold blood murdered by the Nazis. For her to say that shows either an ignorance of history or a chutzpah, if you will, uh, that exceeds anything I've ever seen. And as to her ridiculous claim that the president is losing sleep over her, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that I doubt the president has to take even half a baby aspirin to get to sleep over the things that this congresswoman says. Yeah, I do want to specify that th this BDS resolution doesn't specifically mention Israel or the pro-Palestinian boycott, but she apparently talked to some media and says that it does uh, reference Israel. Thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. Right. Thank you, Heather. Have a great Have a good day. Weekend. Nice to see you guys <laughs> at the end of the weekend, too. I mean, yeah. there are tens of millions of people are going to feel that heat. So that's picture last night. Hmm. Coming up, President Trump in a back and forth with Tehran. Ignoring multiple calls to stand down and was threatening the safety of the ship and the ship's crew. The drone was immediately destroyed. The president saying a U.S. warship destroyed an Iranian drone in the Strait of Hormuz. Tehran claiming it never happened. So where did the rising tensions go from here? Big story there. Also new developments in those mysterious deaths in the Dominican Republic. Will brand new safety measures make a difference in protecting American tourists? Back to our top story right now. Iran denying the U.S. Navy destroyed one of its drones. President Trump says that our warship shot down the unmanned aircraft when it threatened the USS Boxer now patrolling in the Strait of Hormuz. I want to bring in Dr. Walid Fares, Fox News National Security Foreign Affairs Analyst. Doc, good morning to you and thanks for good morning. coming back Thank here. You. What, what do you think is going on here? Well, Bill, the big picture is the most important at this point in time. We are continuing to put pressure and tightening this whole circle around Iran by sanctions and by deployments. The Iranian regime do not want to engage in full-scale confrontation with us, they would lose it now. So what they're trying to do is those minor tactical moves to cause us, to push us, to trigger an action so that they could go to the international community and, of course, expose us, shooting down the drone, sending their drone, their militias are moving in Iraq and Syria. That's what they're trying to do. But you cannot provoke the U.S. military to the point where they take action against Iran because it's going to be bloody and they're going to lose. They are calculating, that they're good, you know, at a chess game. They are calculating that if they do an action and we respond, they would respond again, but not to the level of a full-scale confrontation. They think that they can control the rules of engagement. That's their plan. But here at the White House and the Pentagon, they know that. So every time they engage us, we have the appropriate, proportional, mm -hmm. and timely response. Okay, Walid, I want you to react to two things. First of all, the president of the White House yesterday when he was explaining what's happening with Iran. Watch here and listen. When I took over and Mike and I came into uh, office, uh, Iran was uh, the scourge of the world. They were doing 14 different sites of confliction. They were fighting and uh, causing problems in Yemen and Syria and Iraq and all over. It's a much different country right now. You look at what's happening, you look at them pulling back. And they're not pulling back because they love us, they're pulling back because they don't have money. He, he said a lot there while he'd analyze that. 